Now it is my pleasure to introduce from the Council on Race and Equity, Zabine Mizra, Candace Chestnut, and Nicole Maynard Elliott. Please welcome them. Thank you, Joan. Actually, I'm Michelle Maynard Elliott. Didn't uh, I say Michelle? Uh, oh, yeah, Michelle. It's, it's I said fine. Michelle, right. I'm sorry. Um, really, really uh, excited for this opportunity to partner with the Chappaqua Library. Um, I thought of, think very fondly of the library from back in the days when I went as a, as a child to dropping my kids off to doing alumni interviews there. Uh, very much a fan um, and looking forward to this, this opportunity. I'm going to introduce um, my co-chair and the uh, CEO of um, the Council on Race and Equity, first Candace Chestnut, who's going to talk about our collaboration with the library, and then Sabine Mirza will uh, finish off before we get into the program with Larry. Thanks again. Thank you, Nichelle. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, really super excited to be here with Joan and Larry, and just really want to thank um, the Chapel Park Library for their partnership um, and their collaboration throughout Black History Month. Um, a special thank you to Robin Friedman, uh, Kathy Paulson, and Teresa Brady, who have been um, so amazing with their um, help in coordinating our Read Aloud series um, that we offered throughout uh, Black History Month with um, our last episode, actually our last reading um, dropping today. So uh, please check out the Chapel Car Library Children's Room Facebook page as well as the CRE page. Um, but um, they were just so helpful with coordinating and helping to format our videos and just their partnership um, is really treasured. And also um, I want to um, a special thank you to the bookmarks that they so thoughtfully uh, created to include in all the books that were checked out um, mobily throughout the month that highlighted uh, the CRE um, book list, um, suggested reading list. So thank you, thank you um, for having us today and um, allowing us to um, uh, co-present this um, art lecture series. So Zabine. Thanks Candice. Um, yes, and thank you to, to Joan, to Larry, um, to everybody at the library, to all of you that, uh, that, that are joining us here today. Um, you know, the Chappaqua Library is such a special place and the people that are at the library are, are equally as special. Um, and we are so grateful to be able to do this with them. Um, and we look forward to many, many more partnership programs in the coming months for Women's History Month, um, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and all these other um, celebratory months uh, coming forward in this, in this year and, and for many more to come. Um, and of course, these are only possible because of interest from, from the community and from all of you that are joining us here today. So we thank you. Um, we thank you for, for, for joining. Um, so without further ado, we're going to get started. We have a really amazing um, program. Uh, I'm going to introduce, uh, introduce Larry, Larry Danico. He is the library curator. He's a graphic artist, and he's the facilitator of the weekly library art series. He has put in so much time, energy, and effort into finding um, you know, these programs uh, for the library and for the community, and we are so grateful to him for his expertise. So Larry, thank you for doing this and, and over to you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna uh, get our um, program, the screen share up. Okay, so um, when we got this, um, notion going, I had already planned um, the, the program. So I, I actually, um, this Salmon Tour show was on at the Whitney. And so I was planning to go to that. What I did was um, couple his, his show with Faith Rungold and Carrie James Marshall who are all um, dealing with um, basically repressed minority issues in, in, a, in a way that, that I thought would, would work together. Um, this fellow um, is a, um, basically a gay man from Lahore, Pakistan. Um, which, uh, you know, basically <laughs> there's a lot of issues there. So, um, you know, his, his work that they had the show on at the Whitney until April 4th. Um, it's a series that he did of, of 
his friends and and basically um, the the interaction is is really kind of interesting and the play the play here with his work is kind of using a traditional um, uh, painting technique to kind of emphasize um, the the play between the tradition and 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 this contemporary issue. Um, so let's see. And you know, basically, they're really kind of caricaturish, um, uh, almost Harlequin characters. I mean, you know, looking at the the this green group on the on the on the right. I mean, you know, look at the the noses. They're almost like the Harlequin noses and the hats and things like that. Um, there's a there's a sense of 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 humor and weariness about these pieces, which are really interesting. Um, he kind of creates this atmosphere using a very limited palette. Now, this series that's, that's in this show is basically made up of paintings from uh, 2018, 2019. So it's a very compact group of paintings. Um, this this is um, an image of of Solomon Tour in his studio, and you can see the painting that's on the left up on the wall of the studio. Um, you know, it, it's kind of this this you know this barroom scene that 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 kind of reminds me of that one of those scenes in Star Wars where they end up in one of those bars with uh, all those strange creatures roaming around. Very, you know, he he plays around with this this, you know, it's really a, a the sense of humor that's mixed in with this is really interesting. Um, using this limited palette is something which is which comes up in a number of different um, artists, but I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Okay. In his painting, The Star, Salman Tour uses classical techniques, uh, deployed brush strokes and lighting reminiscent of the 1800s to render a thoroughly modern scene. A young South Asian man sits backstage in front of a mirror wearing a furry pink coat. Uh, as, as makeup artists and hairstylists fuss over him, um, these contrasts seem unexpected is exactly the point. Tour uh, was born in Lahore, Pakistan, lives in New York City, and has made his career subverting the styles of old master paintings by centering on openly queer men of South Asia, South Asian descent. Um, so he's, he's, uh, they're, they're interesting characters and it's, it's you know, no, again, with that, with that, uh, with those extended noses, if you, if you got that picture of him uh, that I had up before, his nose is not that long. <laughs> okay. And here is, here is Boucher. Um, so it's kind of like this, this genteel um, uh, kind of, atmosphere uh, and, and he's kind of playing off of that in, in, his, uh, in his piece. But the other piece of it is there's this very expressionistic side to, the, to, that, to that scene. Um, this is uh, Max Beckman painting from, from uh, Paris Society, you know, Look at the noses on these guys. I mean, there's something similar there. Um, and, and you see the kind of um, caricature, kind of um, social critique that's in there, uh, embedded in this painting. And it, it really does come through in his work too. And on, on the right, there's, there is um, 
uh, the blue period of Picasso. Again, you know, the limited palette using, using, you know, the cafe life and stuff like that, that there's, there's parallels going on there in the work. And then, you know, we go on to, this is, um, it, it's kind of rough for uh, somebody who's gay in Pakistan. And, you know, the, the scene here, you know, it, it resonates with things that go on in the United States too. But, but you know, just thinking about a gay man in, in, in an Islamic uh, country is, is pretty scary. And the idea of like having these police searching your car and stuff like that. And, you know, this is, it's, it's really, I, I saw this as a parallel relationship between many of the things that, that go on here in our society. Um, so we're going to move on now to faith, faith Ringgold. And so she did a whole series of um, civil rights and abolitionist um, sheroes and heroes um, using this kind of um, uh, format, which is reminiscent of Tibetan Tongas. She actually went to um, one of the Asian museums, I believe it, it's the Asia House or something like that. And they brought down a series of, of rolled up Tibetan Tongas and, and un, unfurled them for her. And she was so inspired by it that she started doing these pieces. At this point, she was still doing these story quilts. So there's, there's, you see in the background, the writing that's behind each of the characters. Um, let's see. Okay, and here is a Tibetan Tonga. So that's what she saw. And she said, you know, this, this makes all the sense in the world to me. Um, one of the things she also said was, was basically, you know, doing big paintings was problematic as far as shipping them out to galleries and stuff like that. And she loved the idea of working on cloth. So she began to do her own, um, basically they're quilts. She does do quilting. And this piece on, on, the, on the right is typical this series went on for a long time of various jazz musicians. And, and, and so, you know, you see the edge, you know, it's like keyboard from the piano. Um, so this series has been going on since I'd say she started doing the jazz things in the seventies and she just keeps going with them. Okay, and then we come to Gornica. It's Picasso, and she was inspired by this. Now, one of the things that that she addresses in her work is the the whiteness of modernism. Basically, many of the modernist painters who are really on the forefront, like Picasso, like Matisse. Um, and so many others, they're white. What's the black version? So this piece, this is a large scale painting. It's a diptych that she did in 67. She was in the middle of all these, all these riots and social unrest. And, and uh, so she, she painted this piece at that, at that point after Gornica. So she made her own version. Um, and again, you know, Picasso's Woman in the Mirror, Faith Ringgold, Woman Looking in the Mirror. Um, so, so basically, you know, she's playing with um, modernist art history and, and, doing it after her, 
her own, um, her own fashion. Um, so she took a couple of trips to Africa in the late sixties and early seventies and found these patterns in, in, in African, um, African art and brought them back and applied them to, you know, the issues that she was dealing with in, in her life and what she saw as a feminist, as a, as a black woman facing a, um, a predominantly white male art world. And, and so she went straight at it. Um, in the sixties and early seventies, she used to attend protests outside the the museums like the Whit Whitney and Museum of Modern Art, um, basically until I, I believe the first black woman to have a one person show at the Museum of Modern Art was um, uh, in 1970. Two or 74, I can't remember which. Um, and that was Alma Thomas, wonderful abstract painter. But, you know, there, there, there we have it. Um, and, you know, the art world is still predominantly um, a, a, a white male world. Uh, so... Um, one of the things that she that she also wanted to do was was integrate mask and portrait, and that's kind of what she played with in the, in these pieces. So she did these these quilts. They're they're um, they're painted. the The portraits and things like that are painted on canvas and then quilted into these quilts. Um, and so it was very important to her to. Um, to get that face in front of the public. And that's, that's something that she really made a great effort to do. She was very, very, um, uh, they're really funny and really wonderful and buoyant and playful, but it's also quite serious what's underneath it. And, and you know, those issues... That that play between the 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 playful and the seriousness of of her intent is always is always there in her work. Um, and one more quilt. Okay, and she had been trying to publish a book, um, a basically a book. Um, uh, a biography on, on herself, an autobiography, and she couldn't get anybody to publish it. So she decided that she was going to make story quilts and tell her story in those. And that was one of the things that went on with these pieces, with the Tar Beach series. Um, and the interesting part about that, this is 1988. You know, so it was in the in the late '80s, and and still couldn't couldn't get anybody to publish the thing. Um, since then, Tar Beach was published and won the Caldecott Award. If you know what that is, it's one of the biggest awards that a children's book can get. So um, she they've done she's done 17 children's books. Um, in 1999, she created the Anyone Can Fly Foundation to expand the art establishment's canon to include artists of African diaspora and introduce the great African-American artists and their uh, traditions to children and adult audiences. So they basically do workshops in schools and things like that, something that she's always been committed to. She started out teaching. She taught for, for a number of years until, until her work um, 
began to really catch on. Um, you know, in the in the the sixties, um, basically there were there were a group of black artists who got together to promote black artists in museums and in shows. Um, that was Romar Bearden and and um, oh god, um, there's a number of other other black artists that got together. Um, and she tried to join them and they wouldn't allow her into the group. And I think that basically at that point, she was very radical. She was very much, you know, uh, she had been doing this American flag series, the bleeding American flag. And they were, they were very much, you know, she was very much in, in the middle of the protest movement. Um, and those guys, you know, just, it was a bridge too far for them at the time. They're lost. So um, again, back to change number two, Faith Ringgold's more than 100 pound weight loss performance story quilts. She's hysterical. Um, you know, and at that point, you know, she still wasn't publishing all the books. A, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff, uh, the story quilts stopped happening when she started publishing books because she could get it out that way. But um, the piece on on the right is Sonny's quilt, and I don't know if you're familiar with Sonny Rollins, but his she was friends with him from childhood. He was a year younger than her, I believe. And, and he used to come over to her house when he was a child, like seven years old, he was already playing. And he used to play his sax at their house. Um, there's a story that happened like in the, around 1960, 61, he became dissatisfied with the sound that he was getting out of his sax. And he went out onto the bridge, onto the Manhattan Bridge, and played his sax for a couple of years. Just played it out into the air, um, and and got the sound that he wanted. And then came back and and began recording again and playing in public. In I believe it was '63. But you know, she made this quilt in homage to him. And uh, it's great. Love the story. <laughs> Love jazz too. Uh, so this is um, Subway Graffiti number two. Uh, really, really, really great. I mean, th there was a big graffiti art movement. Uh, Jean Michael Descartes and and um, uh, oh, uh, Keith Herring. A bunch of people were doing these these you know kind of crazy graffiti art things that had gone from on the subways into the galleries and um, not to be outdone, there's faith. Uh, really great, really funny. Okay. And um, we came to America. Um, you know, this is this is um, a painted acrylic and then and then quilted. Um, here's Faith at 85. She's now 90 and still going. Um, th this piece is is actually um, she she. There was a story that that the original model for the Statue of Liberty was a black woman, and and I've done some research and found that that actually wasn't true, but the story still works. And the two guys that were behind the creation of the Statue of Liberty were both abolitionists in France, the the sculptor and the and the guy who backed it, but. This was her take on it, and this is her story, so we'll stick with that.
Okay. And dancing with the loop. My process, let's see, I'm going to move these down a little bit for me because I can't see this. All right. Um, my process is designed to give us colored folks and women a taste of the American dream straight up. Since the facts don't do that too often, I decided to make it up. That is the real power and joy of being an artist. We can make, make it come true or look true. So, you know, dancing, dancing in, in this territory, in this space, in, 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 the, um, in the bastion of the, the, the European art tradition is, is a really beautiful image. Okay, and you know, this pleading flag series. So she was dealing with this, that she, this series stretches all the way back into the 60s. She was doing these pieces. Um, and you know, it's just as true today. Okay, We're, we are now going to move on to Carrie James Marshall. and a portrait of the artist as a shadow of his former self. One of the things about Kerry James Marshall is the guy is a brilliant orator. Um, so I have a bunch of YouTubes at the end of this. I recommend that you listen to this guy because he has a lot to say. Uh, my brain exploded the first time I ran into this guy. He's, he's just got um, a lot to say in addressing the inequity in the, in, the, in the museum realm, in the art world, but in society also. Um, this piece is fashioned after, um, well, there's a number of folk artists and, and you know, um, one of the things that, that, that Kerry James Marshall talked about in one of the talks that I listened to was the fact that the first black man to have a show at the Museum of Modern Art was a folk artist. And, and um, Kerry related the story that, that in an interview with this folk artist, the guy said, I didn't know I was an artist until this curator came and told me I was one. And that just, Marshall heard that and said, you know, this is, we don't need permission to be who we are. Um, so one of the things, this very powerful image, um, uh, he, he has been dealing with black upon black upon black using that as his color in many of his paintings. So there's, there's a number of different types of black pigment that you can get in paint. And he's explored all of those and tinted them and played with them. So here's a quote from Ellison. Uh, I am an invisible man. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Remember that a picture before being a battle horse, a nude, or an anecdote is essentially a plain surface covered with colors assembled in a certain order. So this, this next thing is a quote from, from Kerry James Marshall. The moment I signed on to the theory of art history as constructed rather than inevitable, it became impossible for me to simply make more of the kinds of stuff that histories 
are made from for the pleasure's sake alone. The vast archive of human made products looms over my present efforts as both a challenge to push on intelligently and a rebuke of too much self-regard. Youthful innocence as a consequence of ignorance necessarily gives way to an age of obligation. The obligation to wonder at what is now worth doing. I've been at this for nearly 40 years, full time. It's harder to make pictures today than it ever was at the beginning. What's next? Now the fun really starts. <laughs> so uh, the guy is the recipient of a, um, uh, a number of awards. He's a brilliant guy. He's a teacher and we'll move on to his work in substance. Uh, the style. Okay. Now, there's a number of things going on in this painting at once. Um, it's, it's barbershop, it's the community center, it's um, the reference in the style is to um, um, actually Mondrian and a Dutch modernist movement that dealt with um, mainly primary colors, red, yellow, blue, black, and white. And, and you can see this background with the geometric forms and stuff like that. That's the part of the play. But there's also references to, to art, art history in all of this, where the barber is holding his hand in this gesture behind the head of the guy, his hair is, that he's cutting the hair of. It's, a, it's one of those kind of Christ-like, Beatitudes, a um, number of things going on here, always with his work. His references back to art history and the old masters is something that's, that's always going on, that play back and forth between pop and, and high culture. Um, and this thing is enormous, okay? It is... 104 inches by 122. So that thing is like, you know, nine by 10 feet. Big piece, substantial. And look at the black of black. Really interesting. He is determined to have those, uh, what was it that he said? When he was, when he was um, seven years old, he went into the museum in LA and, and looked at Rembrandt and looked at Veronese and looked at all these grand paintings that were there. And he said, someday my work is gonna hang in this museum. And that's an incredible thing to be saying at seven years old. <laughs> um, one of the things that, that, that he was determined to do is make sure that the black representation was there. And in 19, let's see, no, 19, nothing. It was uh, uh, 2016 when he had um, a touring um, survey of his work um, and it was at the, the, um, the Met Breuer in 2016, quite a show. Okay, beauty school, <laughs> school of culture. Uh, it's it's really you know it's so zany and fun, but but you know he's playing back and forth. You know, there's there's all these different things. These kids in the foreground. There's the security blanket flying in the air. Uh, 
it, it's just it's just a, a really great scene that he created and this is this is kind of like the the other side of that barbershop scene that we just saw okay um so he's constantly working back and forth between um different kinds of references in in this in this piece you know basically um uh nickerson gardens housing is this project in in um in chicago um basically he's combining all these different techniques now one of the things that he talks about is wanting to integrate you know wanting to know his way through all the periods of of art from from the old masters up through abstract expressionism surrealism all these things and and you know up to graffiti art you know the whole thing is in there and you know graffiti abex but this was also the headquarters of the black panthers there's this sense of humor and sense of irony. The, you know, there's these splatters that are in there, you know, kind of referential to, to the abstract expressionist painters. And there's the graffiti aspect of things. There's, there's all that stuff going on. You know, these blots, these dots that are dripping down the canvas is another, it's references to all these different schools of painting. Um, this painting called Pastimes, Pastime, Pastime, um, you know, these um, uh, leisure, uh, kind of leisure class pursuits, um, really interesting, all black in the past, all white, you got this. Um, there's also references that he makes to, to um, a lot of classical painting. Um, it's a wonderful, wacky painting. And gigantic. Again, you know, one of the things, the scale of these pieces, you can't pass by them. You can't ignore them. They're in your face. So again, you know, he, he's got a whole series of woodcuts that he did. Um, these very graphic images that, that, that he's taken and playing around with, um, uh, you know, references to uh, the Boy Scouts and to baseball and stuff like that. Um, and here's the man himself. You know, MacArthur Genius Award. <laughs> He's amazing. Um, I, I, again, I recommend really highly listening to him. The guy has a lot to say and, and is, is really um, funny, too, at the same time. And... You know, uh, here's the grand tradition of the studio, you know, uh, Matisse, um, uh, you know, the, there's, there's all these studio painters, you know, Rembrandt, all these people. This is the studio claimed. <laughs> Again, you know, very straightforward, red, yellow, blue, black, and white. Beautifully painted, you know, the guy is really, you know, he's very skilled, again, gigantic, you know, seven by seven by 10 feet. Okay, and these are some of his influences, some of the people that he refers to 
though he's eaten art history whole. Um, Ang, because of the precision, the kind of, of um, uh, definite, clear, crisp image of that. Um, Romar Bearden, of course, you know, the street scene, the, the collage. I mean, a lot of these paintings, a lot of these big paintings are a combination of painting and collage. So there is collage mixed into those pieces throughout. Um, Aaron Douglas, the subtlety, the beautiful, beautiful tones of Douglas's work was something that, that were really inspirational to him. And, and um, the photographs of uh, Roy de Courville. Okay, so here we here we have the links that I was talking about. Basically, you can look at the recording of this and just stop it at this recording, and you can pull up some of these some of these uh, links and and put them into your. Um, basically put them into your computer. Uh, you can't copy them directly off of, off of the recording, but you can, you can type them in off of this. Um, so this is a series of patches that he did, uh, <laughs> the, the Boy Scouts. Uh, so that, that about wraps up the story for these folks and for this, this show. Okay, I'm sure all of you can appreciate the enthusiasm that you see coming out of Larry when he <laughs> talks about these artists and he never fails to, to amaze me how many times when he, when he cho chooses these artists, he's obviously researched them extremely well and they're his favorites. So of course he's got this enthusiasm, but it just is amazing to see week in and week out your enthusiasm, Larry. If anyone has Love any questions, any questions, I know yeah. you well. You know, it's a little different listening to Larry talk than some art historians. Larry, as we said in the beginning, is an artist. And so he has a different take on the way. And I love the way he always gives you a little history or, and shows you images of other um, artists um, and how he was influenced. It's just, it's wonderful. So if anyone has any questions, please put them into chat. I see we're getting thank yous, but any questions? I gather any questions from the CRE committee at all? No, I think, um, you know, he's covered it all. What is there left to say? So thank you, Larry, and um, thank you, the CRE committee. We appreciate your support. And as I said before, anytime you want anything else to do, we're there for you. So I thank everybody who's attended and please have a wonderful, safe weekend. I will end the meeting now and thank you all again for attending. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.